Well, today we're going to begin a new series on uh, discovering God's word, uh, discovering God's will, learning to discern. I, I think we all can agree that our life is a sum total of decisions that we've made. Do I go to college or do I get a job? Do I get married? And if I do get married, who should I marry? When we're married, should we have children? And if so, how many? Should I buy this house? Should I sell my house? Should I change jobs or stay where I'm at? As we think back over our life, we are the decisions that we've made. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, think about your life. It isn't mostly decision after decision after decision. And as much as we are psychologically savvy, we try to find excuses for the bad and the ugly decisions. Now, if you're a married man, that's pretty easy, right? It's always the woman, God. It's the woman you gave me. It's her fault, right? Or, or maybe we come to the point like Jimmy Buffett. Some people say that there's a woman to blame, but I know it's my own fault. Well, it's close to what he said. You see, the truth is, it's the decisions that each of us have made. And, and because we made some bad, some ugly decisions, often we wish we could go back. Or if I could just go back in time, I'd make a different decision. I, I would do something different. Now, now, let's take a little survey here this morning. How many of you sitting here, you look back at your life, and, and there's a decision you made that if you could go back, you would make a different decision? You want to raise your hand, please? Well, yeah, quite a few of you, probably 60%. That means 40% are either liars or lazy, right? <laughs> you see... We need to understand that bad or ugly decisions affect the church. Bad or ugly decisions affect the church. Why? Because people are broken by bad or ugly decisions, and they think, I can't go to that church. If these people knew what I did, they wouldn't want me in there. Or if they do come to church and, and, and they're, they're trying to get their life right, they think, I can't get involved in a small group. I, I, I can't let people get to know me. So they come into church, but you know, it's the stiff arm. They don't want to get close because they don't want anybody to know about what the terrible things they've done. You see, most of us have regrets because of the decisions we've made. Now, I understand there are some people living the, the good life. You've made good decisions. Things have gone well for you. And, and, and God bless you. Great for you. But that's not the norm. Many have come to this church because they're searching for God. They want to make better decisions. And if there's a God, they're looking for him. Well, the good news is there is a God, and he is our Heavenly Father. Amen? He wants to help us. He wants us to look to him to make better decisions. But let's be honest. There's always that tension, right? Is this God's will? Or is this what I want? Do you ever experience that tension? Is this God's will or is, is this my own desires? How do I know if God is really speaking to me? How do I know if God is leading me? I mean, after all, it could be like Ebenezer Scrooge, you know? It could be a bit of an uncooked potato or a bit of bad beef. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. How do I know for sure? And then you know it's even more confusing. We come to church. May have some godly friends, people we respect and admire. We ask their advice, and oftentimes you ask two people, and what do you get? Two different opinions. What are you supposed to do? I've shared before that when we sense the Lord calling us into ministry, uh, I remember getting more verbal affirmation from my unsaved coworkers than I did from my church family. Now, I understand our church was great, loving people, but they didn't really encourage us in that way. So how can I know for sure? How do we know what, what God wants me to do? Now, in the Christian world, we hear things like, well, I know God wants me to do this. I heard God tell me. So-and-so heard from God. I, I want to be crystal clear this morning, folks. I have never, never, never heard an audible voice from God. Never. In fact, if I were to hear something like God say, Bob, this is God. We need to talk. I would probably have a laundry problem right then. <laughs> I'm just being honest. 
Most people can say they've never heard God speak to them in an audible voice. But the truth is that we study God's word, we see how God's will is conveyed through three different ways. The first way is what's known as the providential will of God. The providential will of God. The providential will of God is is something that God will do regardless of what we do. The providential will of God is something that we will do regardless, or something God will do regardless of what we do. This has been in God's plan, and he will carry it out. Now, you know, through the whole month of December, we looked at the Galatians 4 passage. Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. It says, but when the fullness of the time had come, Remember what this means, all the pieces that come together, an expanding empire, a common culture, a common language, an advanced highway system, a port system, and the peace of Rome prevailed. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. (laughs) Why did Jesus Christ come the first time? To redeem us, amen? Amen. He came to redeem us that we might become the adopted sons and daughters of the living God. What a great God. He came to redeem us. You see, it is the providential will of God that Jesus Christ came at the right time and he's coming back a second time. There are things that God is going to do not dependent on our obedience or faith. Now, even though it doesn't hinge on our obedience, God uses men and women to accomplish his providential will. Remember, the angel appeared to Mary. Remember what he said to the angel said to her? You were highly favored with God. You see, God needed Mary to carry his son Jesus into the world. God used Abraham. He he chose Abraham to, to bless a nation. God uses men and women to accomplish his providential will. He doesn't make us do it, but he calls us and offers it to us. And those who respond and and being part of God's will will be blessed. But it's important to understand from his word what his providential will is so that we can understand and know what God is up to. Let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 24, in verse 14, Jesus is speaking. He says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Folks, understand, this verse is a driving force for the Christian Missionary Alliance, our denomination. Remember their theme, all of Jesus for all the world? This is God's providential will that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And when that happens, that's when Jesus is coming back. So every single Christian can be involved in this. We don't have to, but we have a choice. Some are called to go, and I believe if you're really called by God to go on the mission field, you should go. But all of us can pray for those who are on the mission field. All of us can support those on the mission field. So we can all be involved in this if we choose to. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. Well, next we see that we have the moral will of God. The moral will of God is set up so that we know how to live. So that we know how to live. Now, there's some examples. So first of all, we, we see in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. Remember, thou shall not lie, thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill, thou shall not use God's name in vain. Now, we know that those were specific instructions given to God's people, the Israelites, the Jewish people. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, we see specific instructions given to Christians. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. God wants us, God wants us to be morally pure people. God does not leave any doubt about the importance of sexual purity in both behavior and thought life for the believer. It's part of our sanctification. Understand as Christians, We are saved, we're sanctified, and we're called to serve. And realize, God's command concerning sex are not to rob people of joy, but it's to protect us from losing our joy. Think of it this way. If you have a fire in a fireplace, you know, the fireplace usually have bricks around it, it prevents the house from burning down, right? You you take away that brick, and your house is going to burn up. 
So even though fire would be a good thing to warm you, but without, without kept in those boundaries, it would be destructive. That's the same way God is with his word. He's giving us things not to keep us from joy, not to rob our joy, but to protect us from losing our joy. God wants us to remain morally pure. So when we're confronted with situations, for example, your boyfriend says, hey, let's move in together. We can save money. You don't have to say, well, let me pray about it. You already know what God's will is. No. You're, you are to remain morally pure. Let me give you a third example. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we've got to get the context here, verses 13 and 14. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the kings as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers or for the praise of those who do good. So here we see that God expects his people to submit to human institutions that he has ordained. God's will is that we demonstrate godly character qualities and genuine concern for society. Okay, he goes on now here in verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. All of us are to obey the government. All of us are to obey the government. Why? It's God's will for us to do it. And now, my question is, okay, if I obey, what's the results? Notice what he says here. We silence the ignorance of foolish men. Ignorance here refers to those with willful, hostile rejection of the truth. Willful, hostile rejection of the truth. And foolish means senseless, without reason, lack of mental sanity. Does that not actually describe some of our government leaders today? I mean, let's just be honest. And yet, what does God's word tell us? We are to obey the government. April 15th comes up. We fill out our taxes. Do we have to question, should I send this money in to them or not? No. Scripture's made it clear we're supposed to pay our taxes. We're supposed to obey the government. Well, are there exceptions? Yes. The exception is when government laws contradict God's word. The exception is when government laws contradict God's word. You know, folks, we need to go back and look at world history. And we don't have to go back that far. We look at the beginning of World War II and the war and the end of the war and what happened. Remember, Hitler was trying to conquer the world. And Hitler ordered the terrible atrocities to many people, but specifically the Jewish people. And what happened, you remember, he, he had people in charge of these concentration camps and, and they tortured them and they did terrible, terrible things. And the war ended... Germany lost, and remember there was a, a court, and they brought these people in, and they found them guilty of the crimes against humanity. In other words, what they were saying is, yes, the people were saying, wait, wait, we were only obeying orders, we were doing what we were supposed to do, that's what Hitler told us to do, and the court said, no, 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 there's a higher authority. You were guilty of crimes against humanity, and many of them were hung. So we understand the exception is that government, when government laws contradict God's word. Another example is found for us back in Exodus. Remember in Exodus, uh, the, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people were growing and, and, and multiplying. And it says, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. And he tells them specifically, when you do the duties of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then you shall let it live. And look at what it says in verse 17. But the midwives feared who? The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. The midwives feared God. Now, folks, understand the more familiar we are with God's word, the better we're able to discern what we're supposed to do. We look back in history and we see the tremendous failure of the church in Germany during Hitler's reign. But lest we do be too judgmental, is the American church any different today? And more specifically, is Bedford Alliance Church any different? Are we building up men and women that can stand strong in biblical truth regardless of what kind of leaders we have? 
Are we developing men and women with, with moral character? Men and women who stand on biblical truth, biblical foundation? You see, knowing the moral will of God gives us the foundation we need. And when we have that foundation, it leads us to the third point, the personal will of God. The personal will of God. The personal will of God is, should I marry him or her or not? Should I take that job? Should we start a family now or wait? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. You see, Paul had to see it was God's will for him to be a spokesman for Jesus Christ. It was a specific calling. A specific calling. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, it says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as, a, as to a faithful creator. Now, I know this is not a popular message today, but understand what it's saying here. Some suffering is in God's will. Some suffering is God's will. So what should we do? Well, we're supposed to commit ourselves to, this, to his care. Everything else we do as Christians depends on this. Now, now the, word, the word commit is not a single action. The word commit is an ongoing choice, a constant attitude that involves every area of our life, every minute, every second of our life. The word commit, the, the Greek word there, is a banking term. It means to deposit for safekeeping and dividends. To deposit for safekeeping and dividends. We are to deposit our life in God's bank and we will always receive eternal dividends on our investment. You know, if you were here last week, you know, Pastor Luke did a tremendous job preaching God's word. And he had a great illustration, that rope illustration. Remember, at the end of that rope, there was red tape, about a foot of red tape. It represented approximately 100 years of life. And then he had 40 feet of rope, which represented approximately 4,000 years. Uh, again, we don't understand eternity is much longer than that, but it really helps us understand our life, even if we live to be 100 years, is very short compared to eternity. And, and think about this. If we commit ourselves to God, if we commit our souls to Him in doing good, to our faithful Creator, what happens? We will be paid dividends for all eternity. That's what He's trying to tell us here. Some suffering is God's will. Now, all the decisions we make in life fall into the category of personal will of God. And if you don't get anything else, please, please get this. The more familiar we become with the providential will of God, understanding what his word tells us is to come, and the more obedient we are in applying the moral will of God to our life, the easier it will be to know what the personal will of God is for our life. Folks, you know, if you've ever built anything, you probably are familiar with a plumb line. You know, plumb line is something you hang down and, and you can measure off from that. They use it to determine what everything else around it is going to do and needs to do. God's providential will, God's moral will, determines the plumb line for what God is going to call us to do. It, it sets the course and the standard of what God's will is for our life. So please understand, the more familiar we become with the providential will of God, the more obedient we are to the moral will of God, the better we'll be able to discern the personal will of God. You see, in ministry, I've had the privilege of seeing people's life change, transformed, watching them grow in their faith. Some come into the church and they have a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness. But as they come to services and you as a people are so warm and friendly, encouraging. They get into God's Word. They begin to read and study God's Word. God's Word begins to get into their life, and they realize they need to change. And I've watched people's lives literally be turned around. They have understood God's providential will. They, they study and obey God's moral will, and then they realize God's personal will. They have to make things right. Now, it may be reconciling someone going and asking forgiveness. It may be paying money back that they stole. It may be going and, and, and just sitting down and talking. It may be moving out of an immoral lifestyle. But I love watching God's people discover 
God's personal will for their lives and following through with it. You see, the, the real challenge in figuring out God's will is not the difficulty of knowing what it is or isn't God speaking to us about. Understand the real problem. The real problem is that we are unwilling to follow through. The real problem is we're unwilling to follow through. You see, God desires is to communicate to us. If he loved us enough to send his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to come and take the punishment on the cross, he certainly wants to communicate to us and help us to know his personal will for our lives. But often, we're unwilling to follow through. What do we want? We want God to show us the future. Some of us, this is the perception we have of God. We, we think of God like some game show host. And here we have door number one. Or you can choose door number two or door number three. That's what we think God ought to do. Open the doors. Let us see what it is. And then we'll choose. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't give options one, two, and three. He has a specific personal message for us. God directs and communicates assuming action, assuming participation, assuming obedience. And God waits until he knows in our heart we're ready to say yes. No matter what God wants us to do, we say yes, yes, yes. I surrender your will, not my will. And when you get to that point in your life, you will hear from God, you will hear loud and clear because God loves to give his children direction. Listen, God does not give us information for our contemplation and consideration. God does not give us information for contemplation and consideration. God gives, us, gives out direction and information for participation. God gives out direction and information for participation. God has an uncanny way of knowing when we're ready to do what he is saying or we're just sitting back and kind of going through the motions. We're weighing all the options. Oh, I want to wait and see what's at door number two. In Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now the heart, remember the Hebrew word for heart refers to one's emotions, one's intellect, one's will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. You see, too often we really don't want to trust God with all our heart. Oh, we'll give him 50%, 75%, ah, 90, 95, maybe even 99%. But we've got that one little thing we want to hold back. We only want to give God part of it. And God said, no, 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 I need to be in complete control. Do not lean on your own understanding. If this is your ability to kind of sort things out and figure out your life. You need to get to the point where you're, you're trusting God with all your heart, knowing that he knows what's best for you and, and not trying to come up with your own solution to your problem. He wants us to lean on him, not on ourselves. He wants us to trust him, not trust ourselves. He wants all of our heart, our emotions, our intellect, our will, not just a portion of it. In all your ways, acknowledge him, not just in a specific area. Now, it's important we understand that word acknowledge in the original language, the root meaning means to be riveted, focused. To be riveted, focused on God's way. In other words, knowing what God wants me to do and doing it. Acknowledgement doesn't just mean, okay, I hear you, God, that's great. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you tomorrow. That's not what it means. It is riveted on what God wants, focused on doing what he is showing you and not what you've determined to do in your own heart. And here's the promise from God. He will direct your paths. He will direct your paths. You see, God isn't going to give direction for our consideration. He wants to guide and direct us. When we are riveted on him, and when we are saying to God, I want what you want. I'm willing to go wherever you send me. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. And when we get to that point, we receive the enlightenment but it's only after we surrender, only after we embrace God's will for us. He will not make our path clear. He will not direct us if we're hanging on to something that God wants us to let go of. Folks, understand, it's not first see and then act, but we need to act and then see. 
We, we will never start on the journey God has for us if we are expecting God to show us each step first and, and then give options to take the step or to sit back and wait. He wants us to take that step of faith and then he'll show us the next step. Remember Abraham in the Old Testament? What did God tell him? Leave your home. Get up and go. God didn't tell him where he was going. God didn't direct, God didn't tell him the, the destination. He just said, get up and go. And what did Abraham do? He packed up his family and he left. He obeyed God. And God led Abraham and his family every step of the way. But it was only because Abraham what? He acted, he obeyed without seeing. He acted without seeing. If you tell God, I need to see where you're taking me, you're basically telling God, I'm in control. I'll decide if I'm going to go. I need to see the whole picture, God, then I'll make my decision. This is a matter of not trusting a sovereign God. When we want to see the whole picture, what we're really saying is, we don't trust you, Lord. You see, surrender and obedience to what we do know sets us up to discover what we don't know. And as we mature and grow in our journey with Christ, surrender, surrendering and letting go, it's a scary and frustrating concept. This is about growing in your faith, growing in your walk with the Lord, growing in your obedience. And as you mature, you'll come to a place where you automatically say yes to God. Yes, yes, yes. Because you realize His way is far better than anything you can do in your life. It far exceeds whatever you could imagine of yourself. God's general way is to bring you and me to a place that we are so humble before him, so neutral in our attitude, instead of having an agenda. He brings us to that place where we say yes to him. Do you realize broken people have an easier time saying yes to God? Broken people have an easier time obeying God. Why? Well, because they're broken. Due to the circumstances that have happened in their life, either they've caused it or others have caused it for them, they, they, they have nowhere to look but to God. They can only look up. In Psalm 121, verse 1 and 2, it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Broken people understand this. Broken people know that they have to look up. They have to look to God. See, pride is the downfall of people hearing from God and surrendering to Him. And pride is the opposite of brokenness. Folks, we need to do a sober self-assessment and truly search our hearts to see if pride is the reason we refuse to completely surrender to God's will. Pride tells us, don't let go of control. Hang on to that one thing. You can handle it. You can do this. Come on, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, boy. Brokenness tells us, I have nowhere else to turn but to you, God. I'm done fighting you. Every decision I've ever made has turned out bad. I've messed up my life. Thy will be done, because thy will, my will, has been a disaster. Folks, please understand this simple truth. God is more interested in you discovering him God is more interested in you discovering him than you discovering his will. He wants us to discover him. God wants our undivided attention when we're trying to make a decision. And in the process and trying to know his will, we get to know him in a deeper, more intimate level. And ultimately, God leverages that process so that our faith grows and we will fall on our knees and we will claim what a great and mighty God he is. Phil Yancey is a Christian author and he writes this, I do not get to know God and do his will. I get to know God more deeply and then do his will. I get to get know God more deeply and then do his will. At the end of the process, our, our faith is increased and something happens in our hearts. We, we discover more about God than we ever would have known by doing our own thing. And the more we become and the more obedient we become and, the, and, and they acknowledge him in all our ways, the more sincere we are and it becomes easier and easier to discern his will for our life. You see, when we're ready, when God is ready for us to know his will, we can't miss it. His timing is always perfect. And the best preparation for hearing from God is to become familiar with what God is doing and then do it. 
In all your ways, acknowledge him. Stop focusing on where you should go and what you should do and who you should marry and where you should move to. Start focusing. Be riveted on God and his power to work all things out for good. Wanting God's will more than knowing the options. And when this happens, God will make the path clear. You know, folks, since 1991, I have conducted over 1,000 funerals. I think it's almost up to 1,100 now. Funerals are memorial services. And I want to make it clear, I'm, I'm not God. I cannot, I cannot judge or evaluate a person's heart. I can only see the evidence and the fruit. But there's observations I've made in doing this many funerals. Basically, there's four groups of people. The first group are people who've denied Christ all their life, and I've actually been at the bedside of a man who, at his last breath, was cursing Jesus. Okay, that's, that's how some people are. Into their last breath, they want nothing to do with him. The second group of people are those who have seemed to live apart from God all their lives, but toward the end, whether it be days or hours just before they pass away, they confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our God, raised him from the dead. My, my own father was one of them. Hours before he passed, he asked Jesus Christ to forgive him and come into his heart. There are those who have lived a life committed to Jesus Christ, and, and you can see the evidence in their lives. You can see spiritual fruit. You can, you can see over and over again how, how they've been committed to the Lord and try to follow him and serve him. And then there's a fourth group. The fourth group are family members who are absolutely sure he or she was saved. But the truth is you didn't see a lot of fruit. You didn't see any change in their life. And so this morning, I, I want to ask a personal favor of you as a church family. If you're saved and you're absolutely sure of it, I want to encourage you to, to take your Bibles and someplace write in it the date you were saved. Have some evidence so that when your family members are preparing the funeral, they can say, yeah, my dad, my mom, my sister, my brother, they committed their life to the Lord on this day. I have saved October 16th, 1981, 8.45 p.m. Now, you may not know that exact time or the date, but you can write down, yeah, it was in the spring of 90, fall of 2000, uh, maybe the winter of 2018, whatever it is, write something down so that the family knows for sure that you have made a commitment to Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand clearly what God's will is. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. See, Peter is addressing some of the criticism. Jesus, you said Jesus is coming back, but he hasn't come back yet. What's taking him so long? He's addressing that. And that's what he says. But, but he, God, is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Folks, you understand, God desires all of us to come to know him as Lord and Savior. He wants us to spend eternity with him. Now, if you're here and, and you're not sure of where you're going to spend eternity, or maybe you know for sure you're not, you're not in the right relationship with the Lord, I want to encourage you today to take a step of faith. The worship team is going to sing a closing song, and I want you to come and talk to me. And I have now, this is not biblical, this is just something I put together, what I call a spiritual birth certificate. And what it simply is, is you write down, this is a certify that I, you write your name down, was born again, and if you're unsure, we'll just put today's date down. We'll make sure today, we'll nail it down today. And, and then it says, I have admitted that I'm a sinner, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I ask Jesus for forgiveness as written in 1 John 9 and 10. 1 John 1, 9 and 10. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord as found in John 3, 3. Remember, Jesus is speaking and he says, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so you come forward, what I'll do is we'll go over these verses together and you can sign it and you can know for sure 
you can know for sure where you're going to spend eternity. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're struggling with. But, but I want you to know God's will. And it starts, first of all, with having a right relationship with Jesus Christ. He desires that none should perish. If you're able, would you please stand with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you and praise you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation. Thank you that you willingly went to the cross to pay our sin debt in full. You came to redeem us so we could be adopted sons and daughters of the living God. And I pray for anyone here, Lord, who doesn't know for sure where they're going to spend eternity, today would be the day that they would have that issue settled. So God, I pray for holy boldness for those who might be hesitant to come forward, that they would come and talk to me right after the service, that we can solidify that truth. So God, we thank you that those who do know you, and I pray that as they go forward, Lord, you would help them to understand all, all that you would have for them. God, they not settle for second best, but they want your absolute best in their life. So I pray for insight and wisdom and courage that we be men and women who walk in faith and grow closer to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said...